Hello, this is Dr. Eric Bricker, and thank you for watching A Healthcare Z. Today's topic is social determinants of health crisis in Los Angeles as it relates to COVID. Now, many of you have seen in the news what a really challenging time Los Angeles and Southern California is having with coronavirus right now. This is January of 2021, and this has really been happening in December of 2020, so over a month now. Now, it really brings to point the social determinants of health. That's what SDOH, sometimes you'll see it abbreviated that way. So what are the social determinants of health? It's things like people's income, their education, their housing, their transportation, their source of food. So these social things impact their health. In fact, they impact their health so much, and I'm sure you've seen this graph and this pie chart before, that when you combine behavior, social, and environmental aspects of a person, that contributes to 60% of their health status. Their genes contribute to 30% of their health status, and medical care only contributes 10% of their health status. So if we want to improve people's health, the real place to look is on this side, on the social side, and not as much on the medical care side. Now, the reason we care about the medical care side is because that's where money is, okay? And I'm not laughing because it's funny. I'm laughing because it's ridiculous, right? So really the most impactful things are done on the social behavioral side, not on the medical side. Okay, and what's happening in Los Angeles County right now with COVID, unfortunately, is a perfect example of that. Let me explain. So, unfortunately, COVID in LA is just rampant, okay? So they have 14,000 new cases a day. It was just 4,000 cases a day in Thanksgiving. So it's more than tripled, okay? One out of every 95 people in Los Angeles County is contagious. They have had 25,000 deaths in the state of California from COVID. Think about that. If there was some other sort of disease or natural disaster that killed 25,000 people in one state, I mean, what a horrible travesty. Now, there was a, so, so why? Why is LA being hit so bad? So there was a study done by epidemiologists in Los Angeles that was just recently published in the LA Times that examined this, and this is what they found, that the percent of overcrowded homes in Los Angeles is 11% of all households. It is the highest rate of overcrowded homes in the 30 largest cities in America. By comparison, New York City is only at 6%. It's like half as much, and I would have never have known this. Until I read this article, I never knew that housing in Los Angeles was essentially twice as crowded as it was in New York City. With all the high rises and everything in New York, I thought, oh, of course, New York has more crowded housing than LA does. And that's not true. LA is the most crowded. And what does that mean? There was a CDC study that found that transmission in the home is like one of the most common places to catch COVID. They found that if a person in the home had COVID, that 53% of the household members then developed it. So you then got these family clusters. And the same thing was true early on in China. They found that they had these family clusters of COVID. That's where it groups together. Now, the recommendations of the CDC to this day are to isolate in your own bedroom and in your own bathroom. It is very common per this LA Times article for middle class families to have three, four, five, even six people in a one bedroom apartment. There is not an option for isolating somebody in their own bedroom in their own bathroom. It's just not physically possible. Now LA is trying to do their best with these medical sheltering programs where they put people up in hotels and motels, but one, you as an individual might not want to do that. If you would, you know, a lot of people probably just rather stay at home. And two, they're overwhelmed. An article from just a few days ago in the LA Times says, look, this the sheltering process is just overwhelmed right now. Okay, now this gets us to spending on the social determinants of health. Okay, so believe it or not, the United States spends 30% of its GDP on healthcare and social services combined. Now, you're like, okay, well, how does that relate to the rest of the world? Is 30% or a lot or is it a little? It's essentially the same as Italy and the United Kingdom. I think people think of the UK as this, like socialist place, blah, blah, blah. But it's like the same as the UK. But there's a huge difference. 
and the difference is the breakdown of the spending between health care versus social services. In the United States, of that 30%, 16 percentage points is spent on health care and 14 percentage points is spent on social services. Whereas in Italy and in the UK, only 9% is spent on health care and 21% is spent on social services. In other words, 50% more, right? 21% is 50% more than 14%. Or those seven percentage points translated against the $21 trillion U.S. economy equates to $1.7 trillion a year more on social services. So you say, okay, well, but we're, I mean, it's still 30%, so it doesn't matter, right? But yes, it does matter, because the point is, is that the people got sick. The people got sick because of more spending on the social services, on the education, the housing, the transportation, the food. You prevent the people from getting sick, so you don't have to spend the health care money on them. So yes, the overall percentage is the same, but you reduce the morbidity and the mortality and the suffering that goes along with the illness. This is not some sort of moral argument, highfalutin, pie in the sky video, okay? Employers very specifically do this at the employer level. Let me give you some examples. There is a HVAC company in Jacksonville, Florida, bunch of overweight employees, healthcare costs going through the roof. They said, we're giving the employees free lunch. They hired a chef, they built a kitchen in their home office, and they make healthy free bag lunches that the HVAC guys take out on the road every day. Because what did they find? They were going to convenience stores and eating junk for lunch. So they said, no more, okay, social determinant health. Housing, okay, hospitals in expensive places like New York and San Francisco, they give housing stipends to their hospital staff and nurses and residents, right? Can you imagine if they didn't do that, that all the residents and nurses, they would have to live in apartments with like gazillions of roommates. And if they got COVID, they would spread it to all the people at home. So a lot of these places, these people are actually able to afford maybe a studio apartment on their own because they get a housing stipend, a housing stipend. Okay, education, Starbucks gives free online college through Arizona State, okay? So individual companies address social determinants of health for a myriad of reasons. And I'm not saying that all of these things, oh, insurance companies do it. ChenMed, which takes on risk, I mean, they're a group of primary care practices, they got a van, they address the transportation stuff, they go and they pick people up for their doctor's appointments. I used to see this all the time. I said, like, why didn't you come? They're like, I couldn't find anybody in my neighborhood to give me a ride. Shoot, if you have to find somebody in your neighborhood in order to come see me, that's a problem. That is not a stable source of transportation. So my point today is, is that the social determinants of health absolutely play a key part in the health of your employees, the cost of your employee plan, and employers take specific action against these social determinants of health, and maybe you should as well. And that's my point for today. Thank you for watching A Healthcare Scene.